Okay, yeah. So first things first, uh, today's talk, um, it has been a while since we had the NUS Mods talk. I think the last time that NUS Mods had like a very public facing talk was at Hack and Roll last year. So not, not even this year's Hack and Roll, it was like over a year ago at Hack and Roll. So very happy to be uh, talking about NUS Mods today. Uh, if you want to join our Telegram group, this is our NUS Mods com community. You can just uh, join this link or just scan the QR code. Okay, so... Yeah, let, let's begin. Uh, just to short introduction about myself. Um, my name is Christopher Goh. Feel free to call me Chris, and uh, I'm a third year computer science student. So I very recently joined the NUS Mods core team, and I'm also part of the NUS Hackers core team. So yeah, this is the second Friday Hacks talk I'm giving. So I'm very happy to be here today to share with you about NUS Mods. So first thing first, let's. I think the first question everyone will have is like, uh, what is NUS Mods? So First question I have for everyone, what do you think the mods in NUS mods stands for? You can just drop an answer in the Zoom chat and I'll tell you if you're right. All right. Uh, I see Yangshun is here. Yangshun was also one of the previous core team members of NUS mods. So yeah, all of you are right. Okay, most of you are right, which is that actually all the answers are kind of all valid, but officially we are called NUS modifications. And basically we are a student organization that helps to support student developers in improving the quality of life of students in NUS. So the outline of my talk today, basically I'm gonna talk about uh, the history of NUS mods and then talking about NUS mods application architecture and moving forward, what's gonna be uh, happening to NUS mods as well as how to contribute to NUS mods. Okay, so just a short primer about the history of NUS mods. And it's actually a really interesting story that um, is very, that tells us a lot about, you know, the spirit of hacking and uh, how NUS mods, the timetable planner that we, we, we all use, uh, got to where it is at currently at the moment. So it actually started back in 2011 when there were actually official timetable builders provided by the school, by NUS, and they were very troublesome and annoying to use. So the founder of NUS Mods, which is uh, Bing, uh, Bing basically found it very annoying to use and he decided to solve his, like scratch his own itch by building NUS Mods as a side project. So um, building stuff is actually the best way to learn. So it, this is actually like, uh, like Bing is like the OG hacker here because he really just got so annoyed by the official planner that he decided to solve that problem that he faced by building something to scratch his own itch. So it also allows us to like practice our own craft. So actually Bing also used NUS mods as a project for him to learn JavaScript properly. So let me just show you the past few iterations of NUS mods. So currently by NUS mods version three, and prior to this, uh, it started off as this project by Bing called Core Set. Why is it called Course? Because before, before we have Luminous, we actually use this platform called Course. Okay, so over here, this is this was the very first MVP minimum viable product of NUS mods called Core Set. And as you can see, it doesn't really have the polish of NUS mods we have these days. And it really just supports things like you know dragging and dropping and like choosing your tutorial slots and so on. Yeah, so this was the very first version of NUS mods. And then subsequently we had version one of NUS mods, which was uh, built by Bing and Yang Shun. So um, this was version one of NUS mods. And over here, you can see it has like a, a timetable builder here and there are more functionalities such as like filtering by the type of faculties, filtering by the type of modules, by whether it's a level 1000 modules and so on. So you can see how uh, across the years, the functionality of NUS mods really started to become more and more um, polished over the years. And then afterwards, we had NUS mods version two. So this was built by Bing, Yang Shun, uh, Li Kai, Yi Jiang, and Yi Liang. Okay, so they, are, they were basically the previous core team members of NUS mods. And this was built uh, in, if, I, if I'm not wrong, this was built in Handlebars, Marionette, and Backbone.js. So yeah, so this is very near what we have now. As you can see, you have a timetable builder. You can like 
like search for like modules like CS 2010, like this was back in the days when we don't have CS 2040 or just CS 2010. And then very near what we have at the moment, as you can see, it also looks kind of familiar. And then you have like module search as well, uh, probably not working anymore. And you can like look at venues, you can like, uh, there's a link to NUS whispers and so on. Okay, so this was version two of NUS mods. And after many, many iterations, we finally arrived at what we have now at nusmods.com, which is what we use at the moment and what I use as well, what most of y'all would use as well. This is what we're all familiar with. So yeah. NUS Mods is really like a project that started off by students, for students, and is still run by students at the moment. So a lot of NUS students, they have this misconception that NUS Mods is actually like uh, run by the school or, and so on. And, but that's actually not the case. It's actually just a, a product that we decided to build to like uh, enhance the lives of students in NUS. Okay, so... Um, Across the many years, basically you can see how NUS mods has improved. And I think that's a really important lesson for us here that when we want to start hacking on a project, it really doesn't, we don't really have to aim to be very pretty or very polished in the first few iterations. We can just really focus on like the core important feature of our product, which in this case is timetable planning. And as long as we do it well, we can slowly iterate along the way and improve on the different features and the polish of our product to eventually get to where we are, all right? So yeah, the mission of NUS modifications. Um, I think for this talk, um, I decided to design the talk in such a way that we really talk about NUS modifications as an organization. And this time around, our focus is really to support NUS student developers in enhancing the quality of students' lives in NUS through technology. So this is the, the general mission statement, the, the mission statement that we wish to accomplish. And how we do that is we'll help to broker resources, provide mentorship and guidance, and build a community for student developers to work together, to incubate ideas, to build products that are useful for students in NUS. So currently, uh, this might be what you guys are familiar with. Under the NUS modifications umbrella, there were like two products, which is NUS Whispers and NUS Mods. So over the past uh, one year and so, we actually like brought in a few other products, which is a tele nurse, which some of you might use, and NUS abroad, we are actually in the process of onboarding them into the NUS modifications umbrella. So just a short overview of what they're about. tele nurse is actually an NUS-related telegram group aggregator. So it helps to build student communities and support groups, and it's actually created by a uh, by Eugene. Eugene has already graduated and uh, at first he created this a few years ago because he wanted to um, provide an easy way for people to build platforms on Telegram for NUS related purposes and ever since he graduated he needed someone to take care of the platform and um, and I was just thinking you know it would be great if we could use this as an opportunity for us to build communities in modules. So I wanted, I, I asked him about it and he agreed to house the Tellinus project under the NUS mods umbrella. And what you can expect in the future is like closer integration between NUS mods and, NU, and Tellinus. So let's let's quickly look at the Tellinus and how it looks. So Tellinus is really just, um, where's the tab? It's, yeah, it's really just a very simple looking page at the moment where you can see all the discussion groups for like all your different modules. So for example, if you were CS 2040 student, you will just click on this link and you'll be joining like a community for CS 2040 students and so on. And you even have uh, um, like other kinds of communities. So for example, I recently created a, a NUS Wordle Club. So it's for this kind of purposes that you can just very easily like create communities and have them be listed on Telina so that you can very quickly quick uh, bootstrap and uh, start up a community very quickly. So yeah, how this basically works is that it's like a community maintained platform for NUS related Telegram groups where you can just add groups using the Telegram board and they'll be listed on this website. So it's a very simple premise, very simple concept and we are just like iterating on it to make it more useful for users of the NUS community. Okay, so next we have 
NUS Abroad. So NUS Abroad is based, it's actually a CS3216 final project that was started off by four students, Chester, Audrey, Dylan, and Wen Hao. So basically, if you are students who have tried applying for SEP, uh, SEP is the exchange program in school uh, to like overseas universities, you realize how much of a pain it is. You kind of have to look for different data sources to figure out what the what the university semesters look like and what um, modules can be mapped and so on. So this group of students, they were really annoyed by this whole process. And what they decided to do is they decided to build a, a project to solve that issue for them, which is nusabroad.com. So I'm just going to give a quick demo of it. So for NUS Abroad, uh, basically what you can do is you can find like partner universities. So these are like overseas universities. And suppose if you wanted to go to like, um, this university in Denmark, you will just it shows you like what the semesters are, and if you were to click on it, you can see oh this university is suitable for students from SOC, FOE, uh, from science and from FES, and these are like the past approved mappings. So these mappings are actually like fetched and um, from Edurec. So uh, this would hopefully be like a very useful tool for students to. Uh, plan for their SCP in the future when you need to apply for exchange. So uh, we are currently still in the process of trying to onboard them to NUS modifications. And in fact, NUS abroad, they're actually working with uh, the global relations office of NUS to like make it a reality to actually solve the pains of students who are applying for exchange. So as you can see, the past few projects that we have shown is, is really examples of like how NUS modifications as an organization, organization supports NUS student developers in enhancing the quality of student lives in NUS. And if any of you here have any ideas on like, you know, apps that you can build to improve on the lives of students or you have started on a side project that you think would be useful, uh, we will be very glad to have you working with us in the NUS modifications umbrella. You can just uh, quickly uh, link up with me and we can talk about it. All right, so moving on, I'm going to move on to talk about NUS mods specifically. So NUS mods is probably something that we are more familiar with um, where we call, everybody uses it, right? So I'm just going to quickly talk, run through the application architecture of how NUS mods works. So NUS mods, basically, it's very simple. It has a very simple architecture. And basically how it works is it just, there's just an nusmods.com website. And then we have a module search service that powers the module search page on nusmods.com. So suppose if you wanted to do search for certain modules, this is what this is the service that handles it. And there's also the nusmods data API server. So what this is, is it's actually a scraper to, that we use to access NUS resources. So NUS has actually worked with us because we are the official timetable planner for NUS. They have worked with us to allow us to gain access to an to a API that they provide to actually access module information, to access module data that we can use to provide like accurate information on nusmods.com. So this scraper basically is hosted on api.nusmods.com. And when the user access nusmods.com, what they connect to is they actually connect to the nusmods front end, which is actually hosted on Vercel. So um, this is what we have changed to over the past year because uh, using Vercel to host our um, our NUS mods front end as well as our timetable export service actually makes deployments a lot faster and a lot easier. Um, so Vercel is this service that basically allows you to link your code repository directly to this service that hosts your website. So it also supports like serverless functions. So in this case, our timetable export service is actually powered by a serverless function on Vercel where every time a user clicks on download your timetable as like a PNG or a PDF file, right? There'll be a new instance of like the serverless function that runs to generate your timetable. So what I mean by this is, uh, I'm just gonna quickly do a demo here. So suppose this is your timetable. This is your timetable on NUS mods. Okay, if you were to click on download and you were to click on image. So it actually contacts the export service over here. And what it does is it will just, the service actually like spins up a spins up a new instance of a headless Chrome browser, and this headless Chrome browser will will go and visit your timetable based on your timetable's share link, and it will actually take a screenshot of your timetable 
before like sending it to you to your to your web browser. So that's how the export service works. Okay, and yeah, so a lot of these are powered by Vercel now. And earlier I also talked about the module search service. So the module search service we are using here, uh, it's using elastic search. It allows us to do very like uh, fancy stuff over here. So suppose you've made a typo. So suppose instead of typing like computer, you end up like typing uh, like, like, uh, like you made some typos. You'll try to suggest like the nearest substring match that will make sense of what you are talking about. Or suppose you, Wanted to talk about we wanted to do uh, fuzzy string matching. So, so suppose you okay. Wait, this isn't really working. Um, so suppose like architectural history of Singapore. Nope. Okay, I guess it doesn't really work that way. So it uh, it supports things like um auto correction uh, suggestion as well as like very quick very quickly allows you to search for like modules uh, on NUS mods. So that's what we use for like the search service over here. Okay, so the old the so that's what we improved on over the past year. The old architecture we use actually was just a digital ocean droplet at 3.nusmods.com where we kind of had to do our own, we had to spin our own servers, build our own Docker con containers uh, containing the NUS mods the front end, and then do blue-green deployments on our own. But with our new architecture, it allows us to very quickly uh, uh, build and deploy and like even have create new branches for certain uh, features that we wanted to test separately. So other things we use are things like Circus CI for CI and like Sentry for application monitoring. So what Sentry does for us is uh, suppose if you were to face certain weird uh, errors on production, we will actually have some visibility on the type of errors you're facing on Sentry. We also use Matomo for analytics. So um, for those of you who don't have adblock on and who actually didn't turn off the analytics function, you actually we actually like lock some analytics to track the number of viewers and the view count and so on. So this will be reflected here at, at analytics.nusmods.com. So this is a link that actually everyone can access. And as you can see, in the month of January, we actually had like 1.8 million page views and 120,000 unique visitors. Okay, so these are just numbers that don't include users who have ad block turned on. Yeah, so other things that we use are basically, these are, this is our tech stack essentially. We use Node.js and we use TypeScript. We also use React and Redux to, for React for our view framework and Redux for our state management library. And we also use Bootstrap and SASS to write the styles for our front end. Yeah. So, from the last time we've talked about NUS mods uh, at one of our events, uh, you'll probably be curious about what has changed. And I'm just gonna give a rough overview of what has changed over the past years. So over the past year, we actually implemented this thing called the module planning exercise. So sometime in the middle of the semester, usually you will see receive an SMS from NUS to come and do this. So this was actually done by some of our NUS mod student developers. So what this NUS, this module planning exercise does is it, it's made in collaboration with NUS IT. It helps NUS to understand the demand for modules so that they can plan slots for certain modules better. So that the chances of each of you getting mod rec is like minimized. Okay. And this was a fully student run effort that's made by Bing Chen, Elisa, Nicholas, and William. So um, we've worked quite closely with NUS IT to come up with this and this has uh, had a few successful runs of use now. And yeah, this is a great effort from uh, this bunch, this from Ping Chen, Alyssa, Nicholas, and William. And they've actually worked on this in the middle of the semester, right? As everybody was, they were, you were still working on like your assignments and all, they were actually spending their days and nights trying to get this out so that the rest of the NUS student undergraduate population can get to use this. And we also had like the infrastructure refresh. So, like what I mentioned earlier, we used to build our run our own servers and build our own Docker containers to do like blue green deployments. But right now, because we are using Vercel and it allows us to make faster builds and like ha have like less DevOps work as well. So we don't have to um, maintain our own servers and so on because we are just using like a third party service to help us to do that. And it also allows us to have cheaper hosting costs because we don't need to spin up another digital ocean droplet to handle this. 
Of course, then we also onboarded Telinus to our NUS mod servers, and we also speak, we also fixed certain security issues. And um, at the start of, I think at the end of last year and the start of last year, we realized that you know there were a number of people who actually like started crawling all the Telinus groups to like post spam in it. So there was we actually added like some rudimentary spam filtering to ensure that you know the module discussion groups are more focused on like module discussion. So what are we working on now? So this is the roadmap for the NUS mods version four. And all of this, they are not really in any order of like, they are not synchronous and they are not in any order of importance here. And these are the things that we wish to work on. So uh, first thing first, uh, we are going through like a short, very, very brief organization restructuring. And there will be like accounts and sync, a general UI refresh, uh, Telinus integ integration with NUS mods, and of course, improved module reviews, improved planner, and tech stack modernization. So um, when I talk about organization restructuring, what I mean is that we want to ensure that we focus more on supporting student projects. We want to ensure that we still keep the value of being nimble, but stable. So we deploy things very quickly without much red tape, but we still deploy useful and stable things. And we also want to have a stronger focus on product, on making sure that the things that we are building is meeting the needs of the general student population. And this also means that we will try to restructure the way we work here at NUS Mods to have a larger number of developers that's organized in smaller, more focused teams. And I'll show an example about that later. Okay, so if you want to have more updates on like how this will happen and like how you can be part of this, you can join our Telegram group at t.me slash NUS mods. So we are also going through a UI refresh. So this is actually still in, in PR and uh, we are, and this is how the new UI will look like. It's actually heavily inspired by Facebook's new UI. Uh, we wanted to do it this way so that it's more modern. You can more easily look at the features, the main features of NUS mods just by looking at the nav tabs above. And over here, because of how we are, so rapidly onboarding new projects to our platform, we wanted to make them very more easily visible to like the students of NUS. So as you can see, all the different um, all the different products that are offered by NUS modifications will be housed here in this drop down menu in the future. And of course, uh, one of the few features that I'm really so excited about is really accounts and sync. So you know how whenever you plan your timetable on your computer, you always need to migrate it to your phone manually, either by sending the link or like doing it manually. So if we wanted to like, um, we wanted to integrate NUS login, the one that you already used to sign into Luminous and so on with NUS mods to create NUS mods accounts. So when we do that, all your timetable data will be synced across your desktop version and your mobile version and whichever device you choose to browse NUS mods on. And this will also uh, um, pave the way for things like collaborative timetable planning or deconflicting timetable with your friends. Okay, uh, although I say this, this, although I list this feature here now, I would expect this feature to not be here that soon because it will be quite technically nuanced to get it running. But what you can expect is uh, accounts and sync for timetable data and so on. And of course, this will also pave the way for deeper integration with other upcoming NUS mods features, such as uh, module reviews, which we'll talk about later. Okay, and of course, like earlier on, as mentioned, we wish to integrate Telinus with NUS mods in a more deeper sense so that people who are browsing NUS mods can more easily find communities and support groups for the people who are taking the same modules. And next, actually, for the next two segments, we actually have like uh, two student groups, uh, two teams of students who, uh, okay, actually, actually it's just Zheng Han and Jit. Uh, basically, two teams of students have uh, are currently working with us to like work on module reviews as well as module planner. So they are going to talk about their project and like what they are working on at the moment. So without further ado, let me pass the time to Zheng Han. And Zheng Han will be talking about module reviews for the next iteration of NUS mods. Yep, I'll pass the time on to you, Zheng Han. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Zheng Han. And with me, I have Kevin. Uh, we will be presenting also. And we are going to present on the body reviews system. Right. So um, 
So we all know what, uh, as, as Chris has uh, introduced uh, the NUS mods. And okay, so for the reviews, I don't have an image here, but basically you all know the NUS mods for each module, there is a review section. And the reviews normally consist of a very long text. Okay, yeah, you can actually see here. A very long text that consists of some haters like taken in what, whatever semester, uh, taught by which lecturer and the grading scheme and whatever. Uh, the rest is a long essay describing his experience in the modules. So we find that there are some problems with this kind of, uh, this style of reviewing modules. The first thing is that there are very little reviews as writing one is cumbersome. You need to have substantial uh, content and you can see from the uh, reviews in the current modules uh, and US mods that every, every modules, uh, every reviews are, are rather long. And secondly, um, is volunteer response bias. And because one is right, uh, because writing one is quite troublesome. So not a lot of people will want to write unless they have very extreme views on the modules. And the third, uh, third thing is, it's not quantitative. That means you have actually, you actually have to read through the entire reviews and many, and probably many reviews to really get a sense of what the module is like. Yeah. So introducing to you all the ratings, our new ratings system or plan. Okay, Kevin. Yeah, so I'll uh, go through a bit of a high level idea of what our idea is all about. Uh, so for us, right, uh, what, what we are trying to do in one sentence is actually just provide a dedicated system for reviews. So uh, with all the fields, the relevant fields for leaving a review for NUS mods. And this is actually inspired by platforms such as Glassdoor, uh, Google Reviews, etc. Uh, so uh, I think Johan mentioned uh, the first problem we are facing is that uh, writing reviews can be quite cumbersome. So uh, with our platform, we are we're trying to put, uh, provide a way where students can actually leave a review in perhaps around 10 seconds. So as you can see uh, on this uh, ideation uh, picture, there's actually just a form and there are different fields that re are uh, relevant to module reviews. And these are based on what we, we studied like all the previous reviews and found like all the common fields that many uh, reviews actually had. So for example, the workload, the content difficulty and the teaching stuff. And if they want to, they can optionally also review, uh, also leave a very long uh, and detailed uh, review under the optional section. So uh, with this, we hope to like really reduce the barrier entry and encourage more students to uh, leave reviews essentially uh, and by doing so uh, i think this also uh, hopefully uh, addresses the second problem which is the voluntary response bias so we hope that actually uh, since since more students can actually leave reviews easily uh, this will actually increase the number of reviews out there and and maybe like give the the professors or the course like a more fair and balanced uh, uh, rating essentially and um, because like in the past uh, it's, it's really just a comment uh, with a lot of like with and i uh, like the reviewers like were using their own choice of language, etc. So perhaps something like um the workload, uh, some people might say it's heavy or light, but this might not be exactly quantifiable because it can be quite uh, varied. Uh, like what what's heavy to someone might not be heavy to another person. So uh, with this, we hope to actually provide uh like actual values such as like the weekly workload, uh like for example like thirteen to sixteen hours. So uh this might not be completely accurate, but at least uh gives the the potential students a more like kind of a better idea and more quantifiable idea of the different uh, metrics that may be relevant to, uh, to them. Yeah, so uh, yeah, this is basically uh, the ideation. So I'll pass on to Zheng Han to uh, go through maybe a quick demo. Okay. So yeah, this is our uh, NUS Mods website. And under this, under this module page, here you can see like uh, our product. So firstly, you can see some of the things uh, that are shown here, um, maybe tweaked a little um, in the final, final product. For example, this thing over here, lecturers, uh, we can, for now we can freely edit. Like, so um, this, may, uh, this should be changed in the future, but uh, it's here for now. And from here, for on the right, we can see like there's a semester we, we can select our semester because the modules right, can be taught by different um, professors in different semesters. So it's only fair if we show the ratings 
for that semester, for that uh, professor. So we segregate them by semesters. And um, here is the add review button. Uh, well, pressing the add review button, you can see like this very simple form. You can just fill in within 10 seconds. Uh, name is optional, student number. This For this, is uh, we may be changing it to a login system as Chris has mentioned before, so that you no need to fill in this. Right? And you have an option to whether show your name or not. And workload, you can just select it like that. And you can add a review if you want. Uh, you can leave it blank if you don't. And you can submit. Oh, okay, never mind. I will not, <laughs> I will not fill in any machine number. Okay, so yeah, after you, re after you add your review, your review will show up here if, only, only if you have a description. If you don't add any description, it will just add into the ratings. All right, if you only if you have a description, then you will be shown here. All right. And you can you can also truncate it or elongate it or view the full review. Yeah. And we also have uh incorporated with the teams. You know the NUS mods has two teams. Well, one is white and one is black. So that's about it for the demo. So some of these things we have mentioned here, the future, uh, whatever that we want to change um, to have a proper login system so that we can verify um, whether it's an NUS student and whether the student has taken the mod because we need the student to have taken the mod before you can review the module. And we also can keep track of the changes uh, of the review system. We can have allow editing of reviews, which now isn't implemented. We also can allow editing, adding of comments to the reviews. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. So thanks, Zheng Han and Kevin for like talking about this. Yeah. So as you, thanks for the sharing. So as you can see, this uh, project was actually spun off from like a hackathon project at at Hack and Roll uh, 2022. So actually just very recently, uh, this, was, uh, this was what they did within 24 hours. And this is, it actually looks kind of good already. And basically what we're doing is we're trying to like uh, integrate it with what we have in NUS mods at the moment. And so that uh, we can fix this issue with like, you know, module reviews being so difficult for us to uh, enter our opinions on things and so on. So yeah, uh, this team actually won top eight at Hack and Roll. So they each got an AirPods Pro, I believe. Yeah. So next, uh, I'm going to talk about Improved Module Planner. So this was actually a winter project that was made by a few students um, uh, from engineering science and civil engineering. So I believe Jit is here. Jit, do you want to like talk about your project? Uh, hello. Yeah, so this uh, Increased Module Planner, what Essentially what happened was that a bunch of friends and I, when we were planning, like, what do we want to do? What do, what do we want to, like, how do we want to plan our degree over the four years? What modules to take? And what are the different combinations we can take for minors or specializations and so on? And then we found it quite confusing in the sense that, like, all the information is available. You can go onto the websites and search for what are the modules you need to take for, like, for example, CS minor or physics minor and so on. But it's... It's like you have to do all the manual, like you have to do all the work manually. You have to go and search for information, collate and organize everything. And it kind of just makes it a very tedious thing. You have to spend almost like a bunch of hours dedicated just to plan your entire semester out. And uh, what we did was that we just wanted to see if there was a way to automate it, automate the entire process to make it easier and integrate it with NUS mods, which technically all of us already use it to plan our timetables just like within a semester. And then NUS Mods also has a planner in the beta version. So we, we thought about, is there a way for us to like extend this functionality to make, uh, make it easier to like plan your degree overall over the four years, check all your requirements and so on. And then we were digging around like the GitHub pages on NUS Mods. Then what we found was this uh, RFC undergraduate degree planner, which was actually posted way back in December, 2016. So it's been here for like five years. 
at essentially what this feature request does is it lays out the basic requirements of what what should such a what should such a feature do what should such a uh, planner do what are the basic things it should do what are some potential features in the uh that can be added on to this yeah and then there's a there's a whole bunch of other threads that kind of spin off from this essentially and they're all interesting ideas but we like what my friends and I basically decided to do is let's just take this and see whether we can even automate it in the first place because uh when we were talking to Chris what happened was that we were asking if any of smarts previously did whether they already had a, a version that was working on something like this but then what what the feedback we got was that it's quite complicated to automate all the logic because you have like preclusions you have uh, you have to make sure you have done your prerequisites you have to check for modular credits number of modules and so on yeah so it's like it can get quite complicated easily la. then for now what we have done is that we've kind of made this proof of concept i wouldn't say it's prototype because it's it's really just to test whether we can even build such a thing in the first place so like pardon the Pardon the UI and the coloring and everything is just purely functional. Yeah. But essentially what we have is that like in the middle, we just have a list of semesters. So you can just click on the different semesters and uh, add on like what, what are the different modules you want to take in the semester and so on, which is functionally the same as what any other planner you would do, even the planner on NES mods now. But where our proof of concept comes to the picture is like, uh, for checking the academic requirements. So what we have is that uh, in the back end, we you can kind of input like what are the different requirements you want to take. So be it specializations, minors, uh, your different majors you want to take, double degrees and so on. So each requirement comes with a list of modules or a combination of modules that you can take. Like, oh, you can take this module or one of these three modules and so on. So what what happens in our app essentially or at least this proof of concept is that you can define a json file that works out the logic of all the different combinations you can take the different categories the groupings and so on and then it just runs it and compares it with the modules that you have taken in your planner and then this little kind of green tick it just shows if you have taken it in your semester plan then it's like okay yes you have satisfied this requirement and those that you haven't just kind of shows there lah. So what essentially what you can do with this is that as you can see here, you can like if you have taken all of the modules, all of them show with ticks that like yeah, you've satisfied the requirements. But then let's say if I'm missing GC and GSS here, and then I can just choose to add it into uh, my schedule. So for example, if I just do this and the uh, yeah, so if I add these two modules, now the, the requirements are satisfied. And it checks off everything. So if I'm, let's say I'm missing this last module and I decided to add it in. Yeah. So at the bottom, you can see that like under ENG, which, which is kind of the, like it's in I part of the UI is just to show whether you're satisfied the entire degree as a whole. So this red color became a green color. is just like a visual signal of that. You're satisfied all the requirements for the entire, uh, the entire, collection of requirements la. and you can add as many as you want to this bottom row so it'll just show up as different tabs and so on and then you can what essentially what you can do is like you can say oh, i want to do a cs minor together with on what are the different minors i can take and then you can experiment with it and plan the different your different modules your different schedules so on and so forth and see what like what are the different combinations what how you can double count and so on to like maximize what are the, what are the modules that you can take la. Yeah, so currently we have a, like this is just a, a working proof of concept. So now that we know that this kind of, this kind of functionality is possible. So what my friends and I, essentially what we're doing is we're trying to, like for now, for now because of the semester, uh, we're not really working on it. It's just down on the down low, but we are hoping to maybe in the summer, push to test more features, test more like, Make implement more stuff like uh, checking for preclusions, automatically checking for prerequisites and so on, and incorporating everything into the logic now. Because for now, it just works on like, it just checks whether you have taken the module, like the exact module code. It doesn't check much more than that. Yeah. So I guess that's like as a brief outline, that's like, that's how far we are at. Lah. Yeah. 
Yep. Thanks, Jade, for sharing. Yep. So I'm going to continue on. So yeah, as you can see earlier on, the two teams of developers have came to share about their project. They are already all trying to solve a problem they, they, we all face, that they face, that we all face, and they just really decided to you know, put in some effort to solve the problems that they face. And I think that's really the spirit of hacking that is being showcased here and what we are really looking for here at NUS Mods as well. So yeah, um, why contribute to NUS Mods? Uh, I'm running short of time, so the remaining talk, part portion of the talk will be, I will just quickly go through them. So why contribute to NUS Mods? Uh, basically, all the work that we have seen so far done by all the different students we've talked about, your work will be used by your friends, their friends, and their friends' friends. You see, the, the MPE that was built is actually used by all 32,000 undergraduates in NUS, and that's amazing. Okay, even as like undergraduates, you don't even have to be in computer science, you don't even have to be in computing. As long as you know how to code, you can really have a very positive impact on many people's lives. Okay, and of course you grow as a software engineer. Um, you that will do code reviews. You get advice and guidance from experienced peers, from experienced mentors. A lot of which have worked in a lot of big tech companies. And of course you gain experience and you master the modern tech. So a lot of the tech stack they are using here at, at, at NUS Mods is actually used, probably used by all the companies you want to work at. So, you know, this is just a part of what we do to like make our make us better at our craft and of course you get to showcase your talents because all our work is open source so all the work that you do when you contribute to NUS mods is visible on your github and in fact you can even like put it on the, your resume uh, in the past I've had I've had um, hiring managers come and tell me that you know um, they actually like picked out my resume because they saw some of the open source work I've, I've done and uh, that gives them confidence that I'm able to like deploy an uh, application to production and so on. So, and last but not least, of course, you support open source. Okay, uh, everything here is non-profit, is sustained by volunteer contributors, and um, you are just supporting open source in general so that your work, okay, will be will last in the many many years to come, and will be improved by other contributors as well. So yeah. Uh, just a very quick primer on how to get started with contributing to NUS mods. Uh, it, okay, for NUS mods part in particular, we have a README and a contributing. So uh, just gonna quickly look, show them. So at NUS mods, uh, the NUS mods repository, we have the, a README here, as well as like a contributing guide. So the contributing guide, when you look at it, it basically tells you about how you can uh, make changes to NUS mods. And th there's even guides on how to get started. So like the development tools that we use, how to propose a change and so on. So all, all of these are covered uh, in all of our documentation. So for example, if you want to contribute to the NUS Mods front end, you just need to run certain commands in using YAN and to start the development build and so on. Yeah. Okay, and uh, you can ask questions if you're stuck and just like uh, keep at it and open a PR when you're done and we'll do code reviews and eventually it will be merged into our production build. Yeah, and that's, that comes to the end of our the NUS Mods presentation here. If you have any questions, I think we, are, we have time to take at most one question so that I don't cut too much into Fastly's talk. Uh, does anyone have any questions about what we have shown so far? Okay, Francis asks, does NUS provide funding for you guys to host the app? Yes, so uh, part of our deal with NUS Mods is that we actually, no, so part of our deal with NUS is that uh, they'll, um, We'll provide, okay, we'll help to make some like applications that will improve the lives of NUS students. And what they will provide for us is uh, uh, platforms for us to host applications as well as funding for us to host our app. So currently they are paying for our infrastructure cost about, for about, I think $30 a month. And yeah, so NUS provides funding. They also provide us with uh, certain data sources that might be specific to NUS if we need them. Yeah. Any plans to add logins to NUS Whispers? Is Yang Shun here? Wait, Yang Shun is here. So, okay, Yang Shun actually built this uh, new Whispers platform called Whispers.sg, uh, which it allows people to create more segregated um, 
communities. But although, okay, although whisper.sg is not related to NUS modifications, uh, Yangshun is the one that's like maintaining NUS whispers as well as maintaining whispers.sg. So I think Yangshun will be better able to answer that question. Yeah, we have added accounts, but not, we never require it. Um, require login for posting yet. But I think I'm going to do that, yeah. But my, my, the way I'm coding is not going to happen anytime soon. Yeah. But yes, I, I'm aware of the problems and we try to fix it. Yep. All right, so I guess if there are no more other questions, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to drop by the NUS Mods Telegram chat and just like uh, ping us and like leave, uh, leave some comments, leave some questions. Oh yeah, Yangshun gave me a correction that Whisper.sg was built by uh, my friends who took uh, CS3216, but it's currently, oh, they were mentored by Yangshun when they were building Whisper.sg. Yeah, thanks so much for joining the NUS Mods Talk, everyone. For the second talk today, we have Fasli, and he'll be sharing about automated piracy. So let's welcome him. So hi, welcome everybody to my talk. It's, it's titled, uh, When DevOps Meets Piracy. First of all, right, uh, thanks for taking your time on a Friday night for, for this talk. I'll introduce myself in a moment, but like before I begin, right, I want to I wanna emphasize right, that anything I say uh, in this talk right, is, is, my, is uh, on my own views and uh, it doesn't represent my employers or uh, whatever. So uh, yeah, as you know, piracy is illegal in Singapore. Uh, so uh, I'm not saying I'm going to condone piracy. So that, that's, that's essentially what I'm trying to say here. So first of all, right, uh, this, this, to make sure you're the correct case, right, the, uh, I'm going to talk about these topics. So Docker, containerization, microservices, uh, web technologies. I'm going to apply these topics on the topic of piracy. So uh, there's probably going to be two groups in the audience. The first group is going to be the ones that go, what the hell is a microservice? And the second group will be uh, the ones that uh, would understand the, the, the terms, but like uh, they don't know like how, how is it going to be applied on piracy? So anyway, um, this talk is for both groups. It's not a tutorial, it's not a workshop. So more about me, my name is Hazli. So I'm, I graduated from NUS six years ago. I did computer science. So I've been working as a software engineer for six years. These are uh, some of my hobbies. Uh, I, I recently picked up uh, pole dance. I recently bought a longboard. I, 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 I'm into photography and stuff like that. These are places that uh, I, I like to go for food. Uh, if, 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 you, if you like some coffee sometime, please email me. This is my email. But um, <laughs> something more relevant to the talk, right? Um, well, Chris did mention about some epic things. Uh, one of them would be GP.js. Uh, my, my colleague actually uh, gave a talk about this three weeks ago. I'm not sure if you were there, but like, yeah, we, we did this. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's basically a means to run JavaScript on the GPU, which uh, is not meant to happen. So it's, it's an it's a achievement. And it's also a compiler. So you shouldn't make a compiler in a hackathon. It's very hard. <laughs> but yeah, we, we won second place. So uh, the reason why I bring this up, right, is because we, we didn't stop working on it. We gave a talk about it in an international conference. This is JS conference. Yeah, so this is at Capital Theater and like there's, uh, there's thousands of uh, people in the audience. So, so it was a very big event. We also happened to wrote a paper about it. Like it's a peer reviewed paper. It got published in IEEE. And, 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 and bear in mind, like I, 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 we didn't get paid for this. We didn't get any modular credits, you know, and like no, it's it, it just for, it's just for fun. So it's like, it's, it's, it, we took it like really, really far. So uh, my point here, right, is actually, right, uh, if something is worth doing, right, I, I hope, right, that um, I can impart on you, right, that, um, it, it, it's, it's probably worth overdoing, uh, basically. Yeah, so let's get on with the piracy. Okay, so as you can see, right, uh, piracy has uh, consequences. So don't do it, okay? Uh, it's not legal in Singapore. And uh, I just want to point out at the, at the start of it, right? Um, I, I, I pay for all these services. Uh, this, this, like, this is more than the usual set. Normally, people just pay for Netflix or maybe like Amazon Prime. But I, 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 I do support like uh, content creators and stuff. Like for example, this uh, YouTube channel, 
uh, the Mockingbird. I, I've been the top tier uh, Patreon basically on this channel. And uh, I mean, uh, this is the ordered list of uh, donors. Uh, I'm the first one. Okay, so this is this is like an important detail. They they have this pinwheel award thing coming up. Uh, I wanted you to make you vote for it, but like uh, it seems that voting has ended and like the award ceremony is happening now. So I hope they win. So anyway, yeah, it's, it's just to emphasize my support of uh, the local art community lah. Let's talk about what I mean by automated piracy, okay? So, uh, this is you. You're at home and you're bored. Like, I mean, Singapore is in lockdown. It's, it's, it's scary outside, so you don't want to go outside. So, basically, right, you decide, right, you want to watch a TV series, right, that's still airing, all right? So, you try the legal means. Uh, like, you, you, you go on Netflix. Uh, you can't find it there. So, you go, you go to your favorite torrent website, right, and you search for it. And then, every week, you, you wait for the release and then you download it. So, um, first of all, you notice, right, this is a very tedious process, uh, basically. It takes a lot of time, it doesn't scale. So, uh, in fact, it scales quadratically, okay? So, uh, the number of shows and number of episodes, the larger it is, uh, I mean, you, you're going to waste more time uh, doing it. So, uh, basically, um, it's not such a simple problem to solve. Uh, and uh, you, it's, you probably want to find a better way so, uh, you know, as a software engineer, right, your first thought should be, I'm going to automate it. So uh, you're going to spend 10 days uh, working on something that will save you 10 minutes uh, every day, uh, basically. After all, I mean, there's, there's nobody more hardworking than a lazy software engineer, such as myself. So some time ago, right, uh, this is how you would solve the problem, okay? So this is uh, the RSS, uh, RSSS feeds and BitTorrent. So on your Torrent Index website, you can see this link at the top. Is it says RSS? Like most people don't use it, but I mean, like you, you click on it, right? Uh, you get a a file basically, and it's an XML file. It looks like this, and basically, this is a server generated XML file, uh, containing the latest torrents available for download, lah. So uh, for this one. I'm using an RSS feed for a particular release group because I trust this release group and I want to maintain the level of quality the release group can provide. So uh, you can see these fields in the RSS feed, right? Uh, basically, the title, the link, and the description, these are standardized fields. So every RSS feed will have these fields. So uh, basically, as long as your XML file has this field, right, and it's a valid uh, RSS file, so in your client, right, basically, so let's see, in your client, you, 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 you key your RSS, you, 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 you put your RSS feed inside, right? Uh, it has a RSS feed reader inside. Uh, and uh, if it obeys the specification, it will show up like, uh, like so. So uh, the title and then the description on the side. And you can double click on it and it will start the download, like, basically. So you don't have to use the website, you can just use the RSS reader to download the, the torrent. So this is quite manual and obviously you want to make it automatic. So you use the, uh, oh wait, so, so uh, a key point to note here, this is essentially the RSS feed is an API. Even though uh, the client and the, the server, right, it's not managed by the same people, right? Uh, they interoperate because uh, they, they, they obey the API basically. So uh, that's, that's what powers uh, open uh, systems, right? Okay, so, so anyway, right, to make it automatically download, right, you need to add rules to your downloader. So uh, in this case, I, I put the rule for the, type, the show title, and then you will filter out like the, um, the, the, the titles, I mean, the, the episodes of, of that title. Sometimes you need to add more filters, like the video quality, like some release groups have uh, the, multiple releases. They have 1080p, 720p, and, and such. So you don't want to download any duplicates. You want to download the same. Uh, quality each time, right? Uh, so you have to specify that. So you use uh, inline uh, filter, uh, inline search, or, or rejects. So, uh, and, and yeah, so it seems, it seems like a good solution on the surface, okay? But like, um, you realize, right? I mean, it's, it's, still, it's still not very scalable. It scales linearly with the number of shows that you watch. Let's say you're watching 20 shows. So you're going to need to set that up like 20 times and like um if you watch like anime right it's only been 12 episodes and then like you need to set it up again 
So it's uh there's there's still some time wastage here. So um uh yeah, a whole host of problems actually. So if if like you have a release groups and they, they basically run by volunteers and then like basically if if like one guy get hit hit by a bus, you you won't the release group will not release the the release and then like you have to go to a different group. So so yeah, you need you need like human intervention and stuff. So I mean it's not perfect lah. I mean it's 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 a step up, but it's not it's not like the true solution. Our uh, uh, true solution, I would say, is there even a uh, is there an even better way? So let's see. Well, okay. So as a software engineer, right, you carry you carry with you a very big hammer. Uh, it's called Docker, and uh, every problem is a nail basically. So uh, let's come up with a true solution that uh works so well. Uh, it it requires very little human intervention as possible. It's a very over-engineered solution. So Docker, Docker is this thing here. Uh, so you should download Docker Desktop here, and then uh, you can see that um, it it looks something like this. Uh, at the start, it will be all empty, and uh, it runs on uh, multiple platforms. So yeah, it's it's uh, very easy to use. So 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 now we got Docker running, right? So we should start solving our problem. Okay, so so let let's take a look at a closer look at our our problem, right? Is a uh, it's it's a very big problem. So the very first thing to do as a software engineer right, is to break down the problem into smaller problems that is easier to manage, uh, basically. So uh, this big problem can be uh, broken down into uh, search, download, and watch. So we're going to solve each problem individually, basically. So we're going to start off with the download problem first because uh, it's, it's one of the simplest, it's the lowest uh, level to start off with. So um, let, okay, so to solve download, right? Basically, there's two ways we can go about this. I categorize download clients, right, in uh, in these two big categories: torrents and Usenet. So torrents, right? Uh, probably no, needs no introduction. Uh, basically, you don't pretend. You know why it is. But what the hell is Usenet, right? So um, you see, right, a long time ago when piracy was developing, right, it went two separate ways. So it either went the P2P way, the distributed way. Uh, which is torrents and uh, the underground way, which is Usenet. So Usenet is very, very old technology. It's kind of like mailing list. So it's basically almost the same as email. And uh, basically, people have been sharing videos over e uh, like what is essentially email, uh, basically. These unpronounceable names, uh, NZB uh, get. So NZB stands for Newsnet. So news meaning like, like, like like news like newspaper like news uh with a z and net meaning uh still so yeah so they they're not very subtle about that uh so anyway in in newsnet right the videos are in parts and uh, these parts are in news articles like literally uh and basically the downloader right these downloaders they assemble these articles into the actual video uh like at the end of it la. it does it automatically. So anyway, we need to do a selection here. Which ones do we uh do do we do we need to, uh, do we use for our solution? So uh, I'm gonna choose Qubit Torrent and NZB Get for this uh demo. They they they're all functionally equivalent, so you can use any one you like. So uh, but I I I like these ones. So anyway, uh, I I open the terminal, and then I go to uh, this is uh NZB. Yeah. Uh, so basically, in this folder, right, I have a Docker Compose file. Uh, and the, okay, yeah, I, I, I was about to type this out, but I, uh, I think it's going to take a long time to type everything out. Uh, but okay, so you, you basically need, uh, you basically get this from uh, Linux servers. Uh, it's a collection of Docker images, right? That that are ready made. So you don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, you you just take something that already exists. So uh, Linux servers is a very good distribution of uh, Docker images. So basically, right, you just take uh this part. You copy it and paste it in your uh your Docker compose file. So so but but you need to also know your uh your user ID and group. So my user ID is 501 and 20. So in the file, example file, right? It was 1,000, 1,000. 
So you need to uh, change it to 501 and 20 here to make sure the permissions are correct. Then you have to mount the volumes here. So you just add the uh, the two volumes at the, uh, here and like, uh, and, and basically you're good to go. So basically, once you are, you're done that, right, you, you can just uh, Docker compose uh, D. So and basically this command, right, will uh, start the service. Uh, we actually will download the image uh, and start the service. So uh, we can take a look at the service in a moment. So it looks like this. Uh, oh, I need a password. Uh, it's it's nzb get, and password is. There's a default password. So yeah, yeah. yeah so it's uh, it's not like a normal desktop application is on the web so it's a web app basically okay so uh let's let's get on with qubit torrent now uh and we do the same thing basically there's also an image for qubit torrent and uh you set up the exact same way and uh you started okay so so now you have two services right uh and we and we like to uh, uh we're gonna i'm gonna call it as a microservice because all it does is it's a self-contained service right and it only does one thing which is download files uh and basically uh yeah so microservices are just regular services uh if that makes sense so um so the system so far looks like this uh so we have two microservices and uh but we have nothing to uh tell it what to download and stuff the most obvious things to solve next is the search problem so one thing about search is right there's no google for for torrents basically so uh i i want something right that you can search a term and then they give you a list of direct downloads, like not, not, not like web pages and stuff. So, so I want, I want my own mini Google just for torrent. And there's too many websites to, uh, to search. Basically, if you write a, a, a searcher for one website, right, then you have to rewrite the thing for another website. I mean, they all build differently. Okay. So, uh, you need, you need like uh, certain modifications and stuff like that. So what if you could search through all the current websites, right? Through a standardized search API, basically. So uh, turns out, right? A search API for torrents exists. Uh, so this is this, this is something called TorSnap. TorS uh, meaning torrent with a Z and then net meaning steel. Uh, it, it's based on new snaps. Uh, and uh, basically, I, I, I will spare you the details, but like, if you want to check out the specification, it's all right here. You can, you can, you can see like the request and the response and whatever, but like, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's very dry. So I won't go through, through it. So uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's try to bring up our own Google. So uh, there's two services, right? There's, there's two projects, right? That, that produces this API. So uh, one of them is Jacket, the other one is Paula. And Jacket is an older uh, project. So I'm going to pick Paula because it's the latest and the greatest. So I, I want the, the bleeding edge. So it's, it's so bleeding edge, right? Uh, that uh, there's no stable release for it. Uh, so as you can see in my Docker Compose file, right? Uh, it's, it's using the nightly build because there's no, uh, there's no stable build for it. So uh, anyway, uh, let's go to Prowler and then and then uh, start it up. Okay, so Prowler, oh Prowler started already. This first. Okay, Prowler will look like uh like this. So basically, after you configure everything, like okay, basically uh there's a uh there's this. Side, in the sidebar, it says indexes. You can add your own indexes here. So I already configured one here, which is a, a new snap uh, uh, indexer. Uh, you, can see, you can see in the under protocol, it says NZB. So you also can add a torrent uh, indexer. So like say uh, Pirate Bay is a, is a very common one. So you click on it and then basically uh, you just uh, can just test and then save. And uh, and then and then you're done. You 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 don't have to configure anything else. Okay, so so you can now search for uh, through through this uh, indexes right through one unified interface basically. So you click on search right. You can do a query here. 
let's let's search for um my desktop, darling. And uh. Uh wait, wait. oh wait, wait wait this is the search bar is right here not okay sorry uh my desktop darling so you can see the results right on the on on the page itself uh and you can see that uh the what the file size the what protocol is on uh what's the age uh what category it is uh and there's uh there's there's uh there's flex if you uh, it can tell you it's a qual it's a quality release basically, uh, and uh, yeah. So now you have your own Google mini Google, right? Just for torrents. So yeah, but um, it's still not all the way there, isn't it? Like you, you still need you still need to know. I mean, it's still it's still quite manual. You need to search for the the show itself. Uh, it's missing a lot of rich information. So um, this information will be provided by uh. PVDB by the movie database and NEDB. So there's already a project for, for this and uh, it's called uh, Radar and Sonar. So you realize there's a, there's, a, there's a certain pattern going on here. They all end with EIR. So uh, Radar is for movies. Sonar is for uh, TV series. Okay, so let, let's, uh, let's, uh, let, let's, start, let's start those, uh, those services right now, actually. So, and sonar okay so okay so after you start up sonar and radar right uh you need to go to crawler right and go to settings uh there's apps so you need to add uh it was weird okay but you, you need to go to settings and then uh add radar and sonar here so i already did that uh but like basically all you have to do is you type in the ip address and then you get the api key the api key could be got from uh basically going to uh sonar itself and going to settings there's a, a API key right here. So you copy this and you, you put it in uh, in Prowler. So Prowler is 9696. And then um, basically, uh, so uh, set them to full sync. And then, and then this, what this does, right, it basically all the indexes, uh, they will add it to Sonar and Radar because Radar and Sonar, you need to configure it individually uh, and it's a pain. So they, 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 they made this to uh, make it uh, more efficient. So, okay. So now that uh, we have it, uh, it it's, 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 almost, it's almost complete already. The system is almost complete. So we can actually start downloading stuff. Uh, so let's, let's just go to, uh, let's go to Radar. Okay, so uh, so how you add a new movie, right? You just click on add new movie, uh, and then you 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 add the movie that you want. So like for example, right, I want to add the Cars movie. Uh, Cars three. Okay, so basically, uh, it, it gives you the option to choose uh where to download it, uh whether to monitor or not. Like like it could be a movie in the future, like it hasn't come out yet. So um, which is a big plus. Um. And also the quality profile that you want. Uh, so I'm not going to search for the movie uh, right now uh, because that would be illegal and I don't want to be recorded. So uh, so I add the, the Cars movie, right? It, it immediately you will show that it's missing. Uh, so that like, uh, you know, like it, it, it knows to call the... Uh, Prowler to search for the movie and then he knows to download it from uh from from Usenet maybe or normally right it will it will run automatically as you can see right it's very easy to uh, download new new movies and TV series right using the system so uh but we still have like the watch problem left so uh basically actually I I, I think you you guys are very smart like if 
I'll give you a bunch of video files. I, I'm pretty sure you know what to do with it, lah, basically. But like for my goals, right? I want, I want, I want my uh to have my own Netflix, basically. So I need, I need it to be a web, uh, web based uh player. So uh, I have narrowed it down to these three players. So we have MV, Plex, and Jellyfin. Currently, I'm using Plex, but I heard good things about MV. I mean, I'm I'm very invested in Plex because I paid for it already. So uh, that's why I'm still using it. But like the new hotness is MV. And Jellyfin is completely free, and I also like the name because it has Jelly and Fin in the name. Uh, but anyway, I I'm gonna choose MV for this demo. So, Docker Compose up. Okay, so MV has started. Uh, MV is listening on eighty ninety six. So once. Cars has downloaded. Uh, basically, it will show up here, and then you can play it, and then uh, the demo will be complete. At long last, right, the system is complete, right. So when you go for hikes, right, uh, you when you reach the summit, you gotta stop and admire the view, lah. Basically, at the at the summit. So let's do that here. Let's take a step back, see the system. You know, is glory. These are all independent services, so they are all microservices. They they all do only one thing, and they all uh self contained. And they are modular. You can change like Prola for uh Jacket, for example. You can change Qub Qubit Torrent for Deluge. Uh, you basically a uh, very modular system, and uh, they interoperate like a like a symphony. Basically, I like I like to think of myself as a conductor, and uh, basically these microservices are like musicians, and uh, basically it's a it's a symphony, like uh, in my opinion. So anyway, uh, let's get back on the trail. I'm going to leave a note here. There's 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 uh there's dozens of additions you might uh add. so so I mean I say it's a complete system. You can you you can keep going on like I can I can uh I can give you more and more uh, uh examples uh of of what you could add to the system. But I'm just going to stop at this three. Uh, so I'm not going to show it. But like uh we have bazaar. Basically, what it does is it it finds videos with missing subtitles and then it downloads it automatically. So very useful because I like watching like English shows with English subtitles. I'm I'm that sort of person. So so yeah, sometimes they don't provide the subtitles. So 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 you know it's uh it's very helpful. We have T D A R R uh, which is unpronounceable, I guess. Uh, and that's for transcoding. So basically. Uh, it takes your videos right and and put uh, and transcode it into a video format right that is uh, very efficient. So there's this thing called HDVC, uh, H two sixty five basically. Uh, and uh, it it basically compresses your video in a more um uh, compact uh file format. So so if you use that right, you can you can store more uh more shows uh, basically. So uh yeah, if if you have a a community like a Discord community, you could use requester for for chatbots. Basically, uh, your com you you don't have to be the one adding shows anymore. Like you don't even have to be the admin. So, uh, you could have someone vote for shows to add, and then like if if there's enough votes, uh, the 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 show will automatically download. And uh, yeah, so it's 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 a it's a very beautiful thing. So uh, personally, I don't use uh requester. I use a uh, thing called search R. And um, it's 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 for Telegram. Uh, but yeah, so these are very simple examples you could uh add on to the the already complete system. Also, I only mentioned Docker today, but like if you want to go on right, there's actually there's there's there's, there's uh you you have to you want to go deeper on into that right? Uh, there's there's uh things for another talk lah. Basically, these are orchestrators. Basically, instead of you using Docker directly, right, the orchestrator will use Docker for you, essentially. So, uh, if you're interested in that, uh, go look it up. So, anyway, like my, I want, I just want to emphasize here, like you know, uh, I, it doesn't matter how stupid your problem is, if it's worth doing, right? Uh, it, I think it's worth overdoing, and uh, you probably, you're probably gonna learn new things, uh, from trying it out. So, uh, go ahead and explore. So, I mean. The previous talk is nice, uh, uh, helping the community and stuff. But like you know, you need to have fun, uh, once in a while, uh, So basically, 
uh, I'm encouraging you to uh, please uh, have uh, to, to enjoy yourself and uh, it doesn't have to be work uh, basically that's that's my point okay so I'm not an expert in uh, about everything so actually anybody who comes for a talk right don't treat their work as a gospel uh, you should look up uh, references by yourself so so uh, the first list right is actually pretty pretty good it's, uh, it's a there's this in open source, there's this thing called an awesome list, and there's a list for awesome piracy. So you come visit it, right? Uh, I mean, if, if you want to visit any link, visit the first link. The it, it, it has like all the different open source projects you can try out, uh, you can look into, and uh, uh, it's, it's going to be fun. Uh, so we have forums like Software. They're really bad at naming things, man. Like they, I don't really like the names of the uh, the software, but it is what it is. Uh, it's very, it's, very, it's too hack, it's too lead speak for me. Uh, and of of course, there's also guides online. If you wanna configure it, uh, you know you don't, you don't have to ask me. Just uh, just search for it. Uh, it's, it's it's all there. So uh, yeah. So hopefully these resources are useful for you. So uh, once again, right. Um, thanks around. Thanks for sticking around all this while. And like uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your night. So thank you for the very insightful talk and and I hope all of you have a better understanding of NUS mods and automated piracy. So see you next week for the next talk.